Commissioner of the Public Service Department. I'm here at the uh, Solar Society Task Force meeting, um, November 13th, 2015, Happy Friday. Um, I, I, we just got this evening, the agenda out and all the materials out. I'm going to kind of uh, make an executive decision and ask for your support, unless you feel like you want to make a different decision and we can overrule it. I'm thinking we should go through, we have the regional planning director's pilot folks here. Um, I feel like we should go through that and give them a little more time. But I think in light of the fact that uh, uh, Senator Stelling Memorial is upstairs starting at 2. I'd like to be done here at 5 or 2. Let like people go up there if they wish, uh, or at least this man, this part. I will add our key issues and potential solutions on the way back to the food line next week. I just feel like um, that's going to go from 2 to 2 to 3. We're going to stay at the point of 3. I think it's better if we just do this first part and then call it a day. Is that okay? Uh, okay. That's good. Thank you. Okay, so in my lab, let's go through. Um, uh, first of all, we should do introductions. Um, we didn't get to do that. So, Robert, let's we'll start. I'm Robert Dawson, Vermont Power, and I'm going to be Mitch McVeigh, representing the West Coast. Andy Rob Hogan, with Duncan Saunders, representing Renewable Energy in Vermont. And Karen Horn, with the Sam, you're on the phone. You want to say hi? Hi, this is Sam Swanson. Uh, I live in Virginia, uh, South Carolina. Thanks. I know I'm going to be in the Hi, I'm Adam Lucci from the Aston County Regional Planning Commission, representing all the regional planning commissions. And Brown, we're on the public service. Hi, John Copan from the public service department. And we're going to the Department of Public Service. Great, so thanks for the introductions, everybody. Um, so uh, we have to approve the minutes from um, the November 3rd meeting a couple of weeks ago. Anyone have one of motion?
fundamental uh, pieces of the study with, with some emphasis on the uh, on the <coughs> you're particularly interested in, which is the, the uh, solar siting aspect. Um, but let me, uh, let me run through. Ah. Taylor is now here. Excellent. <laughs> um, so so one of the, one of the things that, that you know we're asked to look at this uh, study we're starting to look at with with the um, public service department is to say okay what 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 do we really need to do in, in practical um, terms to, to meet the state's energy goals and there's a number of state energy goals you folks probably know all about all of them we threw a few up there on the board but the, the one that we're really um, you know kind of targeting a lot of our numbers around is 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 this one which is kind of a, a long term um, you know goal line uh, objective 90 percent of Vermont's total energy needs from all across all sectors from all sources from renewables by 2050 and I think you know I've, I've heard a lot of buy-in around that goal around, around the state around the region and that's a great thing we should we should all aspire for that we support um, that goal we support renewable energy we want to deal with greenhouse gas emissions we put in our, our town plans and our regional plans a lot of language that's that's supportive of those general ideas, but we, we haven't really put a lot of um, hard numbers to it. What does that actually mean on the ground, around the state, and in our regions? And so that is one of the main uh, thrusts of this thing. is really a big educational effort about what does this mean, and what do we actually have to do to get there across all energy sectors and and region by region around the state. So. We started with this project with, with three regions, Bennington County down in southwestern Vermont, two rivers out of Queechee Regional Commission on the eastern side of the state, and northwest regional in the northwest. Nice geographic spread um, around the state, fairly representative of, of the uh, borough regions in the state anyway. So, as I said, what would this 90 by 50 goal really look like? How do we break it down? Well, we are working with, have been working with Vermont Energy Investment Corporation and the Energy Action Network to try to um, discern just what it does look like. And, we, and we've worked with them um, using this um, long-range energy alternatives planning model to try to get to some of those numbers, um, to, try, to try to run some scenarios to see what it would look like. Um, we, as the regions, provided a lot of data on our current energy use, uh, current demographic and housing data uh, to input into the model. And then, the, and then the model using the 90 by 2050 as the end goal, as, as the, and the, the finish line, says, okay, what does it look like over time to get to that, both statewide and in the regions? And uh, this is sort of a very global summary type graph that, um, that, that shows some, I think, some important things. Uh, probably the most important thing is, you know, we're here now, and instead of seeing an increase in energy uh, consumption over time, under any scenario imagined under this model, we see a decrease. That hatch line at the top, um, the top of that is assuming aggressive implementation in pursuit of existing policies and, and programs that we would actually see a slight decline over time. Um, this, this area here is what we need to do in addition to that through new programs, new efficiencies, new conservation measures to reduce energy consumption even further to get down to about a, about a one-third reduction in total energy use over where we are right now. And then the, the colored sections below it are, are kind of what that means sector by sector is. Um, so this is this is a, 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 just a picture of total total energy um, uh, supply by fuel and what the demand for that would be over time. So again, um, uh, using the 90 by 50 as our as our end goal. And you know, I, I will I'll have to you know preface all this data and all this model results as saying that. Of course, it's all based on a lot of assumptions, right? You have to make assumptions to get there. So, you know, we can we can change assumptions as we go along. We've tried to make the most reasonable assumptions um, that we can make to still get us to that, that end point. Some of the really um, 
big things that stand out from this is, again, you know, the white space on the top is the reduction in, the, in energy use. That's, I think, one of the, the most important things. The, one of the other big things to notice is that this, this box here is electricity, and electricity consumption actually has to increase quite substantially by somewhere around two-thirds um, because a lot, a lot of um, the, uh, the uh, combustion-based fossil fuel uh, use is replaced by more efficient uh, ele electricity and electrical devices that, uh, and the electricity would come from renewable sources. So that's a key piece of it. Other piece, if you go down to the bottom, you see kind of an upramping of, of biodiesel and ethanol, liquid biofuels, which is important in both the uh, uh, transportation and, and uh, space heating sectors. Um, a lot of discussion in some of the regions about whether that's a, a fair thing to include as, as renewable um, or fully renewable. And then, you know, some of the other things to note is that, right, this is our transportation sector here, right? Gas and diesel and jet fuel, and you can kind of see what happens to that. So we're talking about a remarkable transformation. Can you leave that slide? Sure, well, this one's, this one's about... Okay, we have a clarifying question. Yes. So when you talked about assumptions that you put into this model, did, when you talked about the assumptions you put into this model, did you use the goals that you laid out in terms of the efficiency, housing efficiency, and the greenhouse gas, and did you use all of those in making this assumption? Yeah, um, yeah really, the, the, the basic um, goal that was driving a lot of the assumptions was the 90% renewables by 2050. But, you know, some, some of the, um, some of the assumptions, you know, we're, we're not, again, we're not like starting from, from uh, point zero and, and kind of creating our own endpoint. We're accepting the state policy at 90 by 2050 as the endpoint. So that's an assumption in and of itself. And then, and then we're making, um, you know, some significant assumptions all along the way about, well, how, how do you get there, right? And uh, one of the big assumptions is the amount of reduced energy consumption. You know, for the model to really work, you have to knock down the overall <coughs> energy consumption. You could not do that and try to find a whole lot more renewable energy. Um, you know, but we, we chose to make the assumption that, that you would, we would be able to reduce the um, So the reduced energy consumption, does that go to our efficiency goals yes. or our efficiency programs? Yeah, for it, it is a lot, a lot of things. I mean, I would say it's, it's significant conservation measures and significant efficiency measures, and I think the distinction between those two things. Um, yeah. but it, and it's also a lot of just a much more efficient use of energy, efficient delivery of energy. So, and, and certainly those things are tied up. Those things are already reflected in a lot of programs. One of the big things we have to do as regions is to figure out how to get those things to really come into play, you know? And so there's a lot of great programs and ideas out there. So how do we get more update on those? And now, I know this data also factors in just simply technological improvements that will lead to greater efficiency over time. There's assumptions made about that. But we'll be right at the end. But, uh, yeah. We've got to make some assumptions. Just to be clear, I think for the energy use and demand stuff, did you, did you redo partial modeling or did you just rely on, on our, our stuff that we were doing in the we, we, we ran our own we ran sets, our sets of models. Because it looks very similar. It, 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 if, if you, it's one of, the, it's one of the, the really reassuring things that we really did this on a, on a separate track. Yeah, there were some, some um, um, uh, ideas that were from like the total energy study that had input into our model. But we really developed this on a separate track. And then we looked at the comprehensive energy plan result. And the, the results are really quite similar. And you know, the, what does the 90% look like? I mean, 90% is everything but this. This is what's left with you know, non-renewables uh, by 2050. And so it, it squeezes down everything. And you know, some of the efficiency stuff is, is interesting. Like, like this is wood, and you, you might think, well, you have to use a whole lot more wood um, to heat. But again, one of the assumptions, we're going to really do a great job with um, weatherization programs, for example. And so that number, even though the wood doesn't go up a lot, it actually contemplates um, uh, heating about twice as many structures with wood 
just that the efficiency improvements are such that you don't need as much per unit. So again, we're, one of the things we're really trying to do is drive this down um, to, to the regional level and to the local level. And so I'm, I've got some numbers for, for Bennington and Chris and Taylor have been doing the same thing in their regions. So this looks very, very similar. One of the big differences in Bennington is our overall uh, consumption actually goes down a little bit more over time because one of the things that the model factors in is um, projected growth rates and the projected growth rate in Bennington is a little bit low relative to other parts of the state. So um, as a consequence, our energy consumption goes down even more. You can see that you know, significantly from your perspective, the uh, significant upward trend almost to doubling of electric usage though is, is uh, probably the Bennington. Same squishing of the, uh, of the uh, non-renewable sector. In Bennington, we don't have natural gas, and one of the one of the big remaining pieces in the state for non-renewables is um, jet kerosene or jet fuel. Um, haven't figured out how to fly electric planes much distance yet. So we um, <laughs> drones. <laughs> we don't have um, we don't have uh, a lot of that use in our region either. So breaking down further. So you know again um, you know. You, a lot of times when we're talking about energy, what, what you folks are dealing with here and hear a lot, about a lot is, you know, solar panels and, and wind turbines and, and things like that. We really want to, and, and the department is very supportive of us taking a very comprehensive look at the whole thing because it, it doesn't work piece by piece. And, and really the renewables is not even the biggest piece of the puzzle. I mean, it's, it's, it's one part of it. But you know the transportation system huge right now. Our biggest energy user, um, a lot of <laughs> tremendous efficiencies can be gained by con converting the, uh, the vehicle fleet over um, to largely electric powered passenger vehicles. A lot of use of biodiesel um, fuels in the, in the heavier vehicles. Um, some of us think that we're also going to have to reduce the vehicle miles traveled. Although the original base model assumed that would be level. Um, I talked a little bit about um, you know, heating with wood and how that would be an expanded part of the use. Uh, we'd also, um, as far as, as, as uh, space heating goes, uh, rely more on um, some electric technologies, electricity-based technologies like both climate and heat pumps. Um, again, you know, this is a big one. You're concerned that the models really, I, I don't think we could make any assumptions that would make this thing work unless involved using a lot more electricity than we do now. That said, we still need to, to be very, very conscious of, of um, the use and delivery of electricity to be, to be as efficient as possible and to make further gains in those areas. Um, so again, the big part of the story, electricity, where is all this electricity going to come from? Um, you know, right now, we're, we're over here. You see the, the drop off from the, the uh, the, 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 when the uh, Vermont Yankee contracts expired, that being taken up by some imported um, electricity that are now being powered more, I think, by natural gas. And you see that growth in overall electricity use over time. And this, this part of the graph here, some base nuclear or something, we'll assume it's nuclear for the moment, and, and all of this is hydro. That's um, distinct a little bit from the stuff at the top because of uh, the characteristics of it. It's, it's less intermittent, and it's also largely imported. Certainly, all of the nuclear or, or whatever this, this non renewable section down here is, is imported. The hydroelectric, um, that assumes about, right now, we import over. 90% of our hydroelectric energy. Um, there is significant in-state generation, but it tells by comparison the amount that we import from hydro per back. And this, this number, we're at about 95% of that is imported hydro. Um, so as the state does, as you'll see in a moment, doesn't have capacity for a lot more hydro. Um, so on the other hand, everything from here up is pretty much in-state renewables. So and, and overall, it's about a 50-50 split between imported and, uh, and uh, locally generated electricity. And 
again, another, another huge assumption, right? A lot of discussion about that. What's the right number? You know, we can certainly make the assumption that it's going to be 100% imported, and it's all going to be imported hydro, and that will take care of our renewable goals for electricity, and we don't really need to do anything more. <coughs> That's not an assumption we chose to make, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but uh, we don't have time to go into all of those right at the moment. Um, so, so what is what again? What does that look like when you put numbers to those things? And, and I think this is really important to our communities. What does it look like in our regions? What are you talking about? Well, statewide, you know, this is the um, increase in electricity consumption by 2050, up to 10,044 gigawatt hours, which certainly seems like a lot to me. Even though you guys can have a better feel for that. Um, what is it? And this is new. So this is new additional in-state generation. These numbers are 400 megawatts of wind, 93 megawatts of hydro, 1,647 megawatts of solar. Again, those are those are assumptions. Those are numbers that, that we picked based on some measure or effort at reasonableness. Um, because of the different capacities and the different technologies, you know, they're not a one-to-one -one comparison. You know, if we chose to increase um, the, the wind capacity, for example, the, the solar would go down by more than the wind goes up because, because the capacity factors are different. Um, in our region, this the, the model allocated the future demand by, um, by the future projected demand. So, um, you know, little, little Bennington County is, is uh, you know, less than 5% of the state, and we're talking about 19 megawatts of wind, 4 megawatts of hydro, 77 of solar, and that's that's just the first shot at the model. I mean, interestingly enough, from for our region, possibly for the state, but for our region, the hardest one of those to reach would be the 4 megawatts of hydro. You know, we counted it up everything we could count up, we came up with about two. So. Um, So this is just a, a picture of, um, um, you know, right now we have the U.S. mid-state generation, we have some hydro, we have some solar, everything else is originating somewhere else. By, by 2050, you know, still we'd have 50% um, you know, imported, but a lot of the generation would be local, you know, you know, where those electrons are not confined to our region, but their, their electrons are generated within our distribution system, I guess we would say. So um, that's the, the rough breakdown of solar, wind, and hydro. Um, so I wanted to just run through quickly one, and we've, we've been doing a mapping exercise. All the regions have been individually using um, common data um, for all the renewable sectors for um, renewable energy generation mapping. You know, where are the best sites, where are the significant strength constraints for, um, for different types of renewable energy development. So we're going to run through the solar one really quickly. This is the, uh, the PCR, so your Bennington County region. The, the east side of the region, a lot of that's in Green Mountain National Forest. And the west side, a lot of it is in Conic Mountains. And so most of the development is concentrated in the, the valley, the valley of Vermont, so to speak. The biggest towns are Bennington in the south and Manchester in the in the north. Um, so the, the first the first shot at it is to say, okay, based on topographic conditions and the prevailing um, landforms, where is the, the energy resource? Where is the sunshine most, basically? And so that's all that the, the yellow blobs on this map. With the exception of the fact that we eliminated a bunch of areas and just quite them out, right? Areas that after discussions with people at the state, they basically said, listen, you know, you're not going to put solar fields of solar panels in floodways and river corridors and federal wilderness areas on certain, you know, critical environmental resources and wetland areas. So those areas are just pointed out, they don't show. Our second level of analysis, um, Includes these things. These are, these are, uh, we call them level two constraints. Some regions call them other things. Secondary resources. Secondary resources, front of us. It means the same 
same thing, um, but, but they're um, things that might constrain development, but not necessarily, but they're things to definitely keep in mind, and your region might decide to elevate them, move them around, explain them a little bit, but we need to know where those are. Those are all ag soils, um, have forest habitat blocks, hydric soils, um, conserved land, special flood hazard areas, deer wintering areas, class three wetlands, those don't all show up on the map. The only ones that we show are the ones that overlap the areas of, of solar resource potential. So, um, so we just zoom in on town of Bennington, for example, to see what it looks like uh, a little closer up with, with roads and, and things like that. Um, you know, this is uh, this is Mount Anthony that kind of sticks into the southwestern part of the town. Up there, we're getting into the Green Mountain National Forest. Um, but you can see, you know, Bennington is largely a large open valley, and there's quite a bit of, um, of resource potential in the town. A lot of the, the level two constraints that show up there are agricultural lands in, in Bennington. And so I, I, I wanted to, at this point, just really quickly um, uh, run through some of the type of discussion we're having, because the value, I think, that the regions <coughs> Can really bring to this. I mean, anybody can run computer models, right? But what we what we're doing is going out to the communities and trying to talk to them and say, okay, what are some <coughs> local issues and values and, and locations that we really need to factor into this analysis? So I'll go kind of from three, and I'll give you from the, the simplest to the most complex. Okay. So um, in our in our region uh, here. Um, there's, um, there's a number of designated uh, historic districts and scenic, uh, designated scenic districts, things like that. People said we don't want um, solar panels in our, our designated scenic areas. And you know, one of the ones that really strikes everybody is land growth up there in the northeast corner of our region, a little mapping accident from colonial days. <laughs> it's a little bit of a Shangri-La, but they have an absolutely beautiful open valley that you can see up at the top of the, the, the map there that's it's called the Upley Flats area along Upley Brook and it's absolutely beautiful wide open agricultural area. They designate that as a scenic resource area. So they have regulations in their plan and bylaws and everything else. So to, to me, to us, to our committee, that was pretty easy. <laughs> All right, to say we're gonna we're gonna, we haven't done it yet with maps, but we're gonna add that as a as a as a level one constraint. So um, based on, on local concerns. Next one, you have conversations get a little bit more complicated. We start talking about all these agricultural soils and farmlands. So on the one hand, we've got the perspective that says farms are actually a pretty good place for, for solar panels, right? Because they're open and the additional revenue stream for farmers could be a really good thing um, to help maintain the viability of the farms and so we're all about that. On the other hand, so we're trying to look at energy comprehensively, the state still imports over 90% of its food. We need to put that, um, the best agricultural soils to, to use producing food over time if we really want to tackle this problem comprehensively. So, you know, where's the happy medium there? You know, so again, it's getting a little bit more complicated. You know, maybe a compromise solution is say, take the, the prime agricultural soils, and there's several groupings of that, so the very best and say, okay, maybe those should be level one constraints off limits, and maybe we should encourage people to look at some of the farms. And then this is one of the bigger issues in our region, because we have probably the highest concentration of agriculture in many, in many of the regions that aren't uh, on the west coast of Vermont. Um, and it's, you know, the working landscape is a major concern. It's raised at our board's uh, meeting last time we were talking about this. Um, we're hoping maybe to get some Important lands data through the USDA may not be able to access it. We can access it, but not. at least add them as sort of level two constraints just because they have to have, we have to have a closer look at them. And then I think we're really going to have to figure out sort of when it comes to doing uh, the strategies we come up with for implementation, there's got to be some component that talks about um, how, to, how, to work, how that solar and work, the work of landscape be compatible and work. You know, I mean, you can graze under solar panels. So, well, I, I can't, but the sheep. Yeah. But, but not all animals. No, but you sheep. Yeah. And, and, and you could elevate them and theoretically 
you got. You know, I mean, it could be you could work it out. It might cost the developer more to make that accommodation, but uh, maybe you're something our our region is considering. And, and, and kind of like to, when we get to the, the extreme level of, of complexity in local debate with, with an issue that we had in, in Bennington and what's going on today, right now as a matter of fact, where there was, um, it kind of played out nice sequentially to illustrate this, but there was right here in this nice yellow prime solar area, a uh, two megawatt solar project proposed to cover about 15 acres. It's about what they cover. And, Kind of like we, we took a look at it, said about well, prime solar, didn't seem to be any apparent big issues, some neighborhood concerns, right? I had, lo and behold, another project comes in right immediately next to it, a separate project, but um, at the same time, all of a sudden, we're talking about 30 acres of solar panels. And the question comes up, and it was debated, when is it too big? Now, when is when is the visual impact too big? Um, and that's a really tough one because you know if you're looking at some of the numbers that we'll you know highlight a little bit more later, we know we need need to meet this objective a certain amount of capacity. Um, and so, is it better to have it all you know, a lot of it in one place, or if you don't do that and say, well, we don't want to cover more than five acres at a time with solar panels or ten acres? And you spread it out over a much wider area. So, you know, we haven't resolved that problem yet, but um, towns are starting to take it up and developing some guidelines. And might depend on the towns. We've got some towns that are saying, we'll, we'll take the big range of solar project and we think that's much better than having these smaller ones right. spread out. So that's where your community yeah. discussions are helpful. Yep, absolutely. And I think, I think the Addison County guidelines that you guys put together, you have a special little load is in on the size issue. Right. Yeah. We, we didn't resolve it either. We basically said, you want to think about this in any time we do it. So anyway, those are the kinds of discussions that we're having to try to refine the, the mapping and analysis. Um, this, is, this is real quick. People like to see this one. Right. So this is just a, a graphic representation. So that, if that's the area of the Bennington region, Right, that's about how much unconstrained um, land we have for solar development where there are no um, identified environmental constraints. Is that just one or one and two? One and um, that that's that's um, essentially one and two. It said that's it where there's no level two constraints okay. or level one constraints. Right. And and that's that's the amount that you would need land area wise approximately um, for seventy seven megawatts. So that's really so it's, it's it's like the 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 resources there. We found something really very similar for for wind. You know the resources there. It's it's a question of how you how you how you identify it and how you use it. So um, and then as soon as we get into this discussion, everybody says put it on the roofs. You know to do that. And I know that that there's a, a study starting to look at. At what's the capacity for that using some really um, detailed geographic data? We did a real rough uh, analysis um, just based on numbers of buildings in our, our, our region and again assumptions. So there's about 14,000 residential structures in our region, and if we assume 50% of them are potentially possible um, to, to do rooftop solar, and 50% of the people who own those 50% are uh, going to. Uh, to actually do it, you could generate about 14 megawatts from residential rooftops. Um, we've been told by a lot of people in the industry that 50% is wildly optimistic, but we've also been told that 25% is probably more accurate. So either way, you could assume 100% on take by 25% or 50 or 50. Yeah, no. it's, it's, a, it's an optimistic assumption either way. <laughs> Um, then we look at small commercial structures and how many of those are out in the region. Similar type of analysis. Bigger systems, obviously, you can come up with another 10 megawatts. The really big structures, the commercial industrial buildings, over 40, over an acre or so in size, we can come up with another 10 megawatts potentially. You know, again, based on some fairly optimistic assumptions. So that's about 34 megawatts on the rooftop, um, which is about 40 percent of our goal. And 
and not to sneeze at that because that would really help. And we should really try to find ways to incentivize that. I think, um, but but you know, a lot of uh, uh, that's always the first thing people say. It's just put on rooftops. There's a put it on brown fields. The rooftops are brown fields. It's all the problem, so. Um, so this is this is just um, I think really helpful for the individual towns when we start breaking it down by towns and how you would allocate this round. Like nobody's going to tell the town, well, you got to have. X them out, but we want to make sure when towns are doing their plans and doing their energy plans that there's some reasonable context and basis for what they're planning for. So, um, so this is like based on the amount of the so-called unconstrained or prime solar land. Um, if you were to allocate our our region's share, if you will, by that, then you get get this breakdown. Again, um, you know, Bennington is the most populous town in the region. It also has the most Prime, prime solar. Um, Shaftesbury is just like just north of Bennington. It happens to be oriented just perfectly for, for solar, although they have a lot of farmland. Um, some of the some of the other issues that they crop up though are, you know, Land Grove is very very small, has 150 people. Again, just based on the prime solar, that was the scenic area that I mentioned. Um, some of the other places like are extremely remote, so we try to find ways to deal with some of those things. Um, this is uh, just another way of representing it on the map. Um, so we say, well, what if we, what if we looked about, you know, trying to make some assumptions, more assumptions about the cost of doing this? We said, how, you know, if it's really expensive, this is a long way from three-phase power. It's not likely that we're going to see that kind of development. I mean, Land Rover. Fortunately, it falls way down here because they're they're pretty far off. Sandgate disappears altogether because they're over on the backside of money going out so a lot of ways for everything. At the same time, you know, Bennington and Manchester goes up, you can make the argument that that's appropriate because that's where most of the population and most of the demand is. So there's no perfect solution, but at least it provides some context to the plan. Um, and then this is a this is a map based different ways of looking at the, uh, the demand and consumption um, relative to population, relative to the amount of prime solar resource in the town. Uh, and, then, and then this is the one that we have to grapple with a little bit as other regions start playing around with this. Um, and and, and then, you know, the department has indicated that, that there's an interest in continuing this around the state. I think that's really important because uh, it's easy for us to do ours and then just kind of ignore the rest of the state, but when the rest of the state starts playing, we have to start looking at, at these numbers and whether they're reasonable and whether they add up. And this is based on the amount of prime solar and, you know, lucky Wyndham County. And um, I always hear from the folks in Wyndham County, don't I, that they already have a lot of renewable energy generation. They have a lot of solar, they've got a lot of hydro, they've got a lot of wind. So they're really happy to see that they get to have more than anybody else in the future, too. Um, then there's, our, you know, Chittenden County obviously is the highest demand in the state. Should they have proportionally more uh, supply? Question. And again, this is just looking at solar, right? So if we decided, well, we'll put a bunch of wind turbines uh, on the waterfront in Burlington, right? We could demand then those numbers change all around. So. And that's so just to be clear, I'm trying to hear about Chris and um, Taylor. Are you guys also doing, do you have any presentation or are you just feeding yeah. into the comments? Okay, yeah, sure. great. And I appreciate that. Do you, um, you guys want to come up here? Sure. Where we can see you and reach you? Mm -hmm. Thanks again very much for joining us, and thanks um, for walking us through that, that work. I guess I'll just open it up for questions from the panel. So either, you know, unless you guys want to, do you have anything, Chris and Taylor, do you have anything you want to add about your experience before we start covering the questions? Oh, Jeff, right. Yeah. Any questions? Go ahead, Robert. Great. Did you also look at um, just ground mounted close to home, you know, the travel kind of system? Because that is an option to the top. Yeah, you know, we, we did.
didn't we didn't specifically look at that, but that's a that's a good question. And we also did look at the parking lots, uh, which a lot of people talk about you know, as well. I mean, the parking lots maybe more because um, a little bit more of a potentially expensive proposition for some of those structures over parking lots that you see. But the um, yeah the residential stuff, I think we just kind of merged the ground mounted you know trackers and stuff in with the, the rooftop. I know. No, at least in our region, I mean, I, we're going to do some more exercise with roof method because you know, that's what we've heard from our committee, that's what we've heard from the public, is, is that's the preferred location right. for solar panels. But I think as the data points out, the reality is, is why that's a good, while well, it's a good number, if, even if we come to you know, two-thirds of what you guys projected, it's still not enough. Yeah, it's a challenge, but I think, yeah. you know, while we've been that out on a statewide basis as well, we, uh, I said this number which scares people 12,000 acres for solar at current technological, you know, to, to the megawatt, uh, sorry, kilowatt, kilowatt, to the kilowatt. But um, you, you know, 3,600 acres of commercial job in the city. People will want us, even though it, it does put a dent in there, it's not, you know, it's uh, clearly something to see is that. No, it's, it's, part, it's part of the problem. And I think people feel better if you figure out a way to do that first before you feel like you want to expand, much like the downtown discussion. Is that kind of the buildings and those infrastructure is efficient to make it so we're done as well? Is it the kind of problem to solve? Because I'm close enough to change it. Are you guys finding that your, your communities are receptive to this, or are they all like, Trying to avoid a um, you know any type of uh, quota allocation that you have to do, but, but when you try and figure this out, it does come down to numbers. Like how much how much do we use? It's either the population based or land based or these kind of things. So well, what's the reception? You know, it's a little hard to tell because when we when we do presentations like this, I think everybody says again, the Jim said this at the beginning, they're sort of oh yeah, we can agree with that, and yet. Seeing solar proposals in our region that get vehemently objected to, and you know the objections always begin with, um, you know, this isn't about not in my backyard, but dot dot dot. Um, right, exactly. And so I, it's it's a little hard to tell. I think I think you know I think as just as I, I'm sure you guys recognize that this is everybody's freaking out because it's happening so fast. Um, and I, I don't think that I think there are a lot of other communities that, that recognize that we need. To but they, I know they want to make sure that A, the credits are actually going towards meeting our goals as opposed to being with the state. And I realize I mean, I, there's a whole complex, that's a complex thing. Um, but that's one of the big things. And then, you know, like I said, in my region, it's, it's making sure that the working landscape isn't, you know, even though you can technically have 25 years to pull these up, and it's, you know, the prime oils are still as viable as they are. Um, you know, people don't want to see that aggregate taken out of action. And I just I just had a, a, a permit application come across my desk recently that um, I mean they're smacking a solar from a solar array right down the middle of a very what is clearly a very viable field. Mm -hmm. And you know, we need to start working on this. Yes. Yeah. I, I would say um, you know we've been doing um, the, the three regions a more comprehensive presentation yeah, around our, our communities. And I would say that in general the reception has been very, very positive about the all the background information. And I think that's a really good thing because I think the, the education piece is a huge part about this. Um, absolutely, we have seen people at the meetings who are at the meetings because of particular projects and their, their um, um, input is clearly targeted toward the concerns that they're most familiar with. So if there's a solar project proposed next to a neighborhood that would require removal of a bunch of trees, their suggestion to us is that we should include constraints that we not allow any tree cutting for solar land. So, I mean, you, you, that's kind of predictable, So, but we have to kind of take all the comment and input in and, and filter it and, you know, through our commissions and our communities and see what, what, what sticks. Just like we have to do what we try and figure out. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, you're, th that work is really hard. Um, in terms of biomass, were you just thinking about 
you know, one of the things that we'll be looking at is whether or not to recommend building this pilot out to all of the, the commissions and planning commissions. And I, from your uh, from your experience in here, um, do, would you recommend it? Do you think this is going to be a useful tool? Is there uh, something different we should have done in this pilot uh, that would have made it more useful or easier for you, more uh, efficient? The only thing I would mention is just more money to look at the UFC in terms of explanation of the models and the materials to provide to our, our regional energy committees that we're working with at the region and also to the municipalities and, and just to use their public meetings. And we were really limited in terms of how much we could work with. You know, as that was a shortcoming, you know, we did the, the pilot, we had the budget, we had three, we had to provide it up, and then it was like, oh yeah, we could really use some help from the UFC. They came to the plate, that, you know, a lot of it. From, and their information, you guys, is very valid. As far as you know, it, it, how important is that? It's, it's essential that all the other regions do this because, like I said, it's a statewide goal. And just like anything with energy, it's all interrelated. And if we plan in, in our, our vacuum, it might look really good for our regions, but if it looks really bad for the other regions, it's not going to work. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, until we make a decision that this isn't the direction we're going in, we need to figure out how to get rid I was just going to pick up on the comment you were making about um, <clears throat> potentially trying to lo um, identify more desirable locations. It seems to me it's an issue of timing. If you've got a developer who's already invested uh, time, energy, and money in a site and maybe already has purchased the lease, getting them to sort of retrench to a different site is so, so clearly that process has to occur prior. Somehow, the town getting word out that there are locations that meet the developer's needs and the town's needs, you know, three-phase power, flat land, et cetera, good location. But we're hoping to have maps that okay. show those prioritized areas. Yeah. We, want to, we want to show those on their own. That's part of the point of this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. also help developers. Yeah. We have one thing we, we've been, and Jim and I have been struggling with this is, is that we have been struggling a bit with the perception that our project is exclusively the mapping and focus on it. And it is much broader than that. Yeah. I mean, we're really, the big, the map is, is yes, it's a part of it, but the, the goal here is to come up with strategies to implement the plan and across all of the sectors. So we need to, you know, we spend yeah, a lot of our budget sort of focusing on This part's easy to figure yeah. out the transportation part. Yeah, right? <laughs> It's why we feel like we're getting really, I feel like we're getting a really good deal for you for you because this is the problem. Our energy elements don't require the mapping portion of what you're doing. Right. Would it be helpful to include that in the statute within the energy element, given that that's a pretty key piece of it? I mean, really not everything. Define helpful. <laughs> something until the town starts sort of really thinking about this on that level I, I don't know how they can it, it isn't going to get it in the plans effectively unless the regional planning commission is able to work with it again. Yes. Um, I would say in, in our towns in order to get to the positive discussion as to these are the places that we want it they also want to be able to say and we don't want it here because there's no, there's no benefit to them to say, okay, we're going to set aside this area and we're going to be, you know, a good partner, and then just have someone still be able to go with other places that they don't necessarily. Yeah, the irony that I found here was that and it's not among your towns. It's like a lot of them do have this, but there are places that have chosen because of property rights. And Until one of these projects comes along, and then all of a sudden it's like, why can't we control these people doing this? And I, I, it's part of the education. It's, like, it's a little bit like letting. Uh, but it is in statute that the you know, town plans are not required. And so it's not a requirement. It's something that 
we've seen more in the last few years because it's a requirement of some of our funding that you have to have a town plan. So I actually, we're, we are actually seeing, we saw several um, municipal planning grant applications this, that are looking to do town plans because they haven't. And not only do they do an energy plan, they do a housing element, and they've got to do a resiliency element, they've got to do an economic development element. So this is actually great because yeah. this is actually moving them towards yeah. a more comprehensive plan. I don't mind whether it's because the other people
can I just let folks know about a couple things? Yes. Uh, in your packet is, that, is everybody's response to the homework assignment. We're also posting that on the Solar Siding Task Force website for folks to get access to. And then we've done a matrix that lists all those potential proposals and, and who recommended them at, that just got handed around as well. That will also be on the website. So these will uh, inform the conversation at our meeting on December. And can you can the presentation be on the website as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, everybody understand why we're doing the service current set on these uh, services.